I'm Philip Brookman. I am consulting curator of photographs here at the National Gallery of Art in the Department of Photographs. And I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, I am the curator of this exhibition, Gordon Park's The New Tide, Early Work, 1940 to 1950. And of course, I want to thank everybody involved in helping us, the National Gallery of Art, to make the show possible. And uh, so today, my job is to introduce you to the exhibition, uh, essentially describe what it is and why we did it, and something about the artwork in the exhibition. So first, I wanted to just quickly talk about the image that's on the screen right now. What in the world is this? This is a very early photograph by Gordon Parks, made in May of 1941. And it shows the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, and her security, Captain Scott, along with the singer, Ethel Waters, and the wonderful, extremely important philosopher, educator, and professor at Howard University, Elaine Locke. This is a, one of Gordon Park's very first journalistic assignments, and I'm going to come back to this uh, shortly, but I just I wanted to uh, describe this in part because I wanted uh, w just to start to ha have a quick shout out to the great art historian uh, Jeffrey Stewart, whose biography of Elaine Locke, whose eyes are peeking out down here, his biography of Elaine Locke just won the National Book Award for, <laughs> yes, for nonfiction. So it's a, it's a remarkable uh, feat for an art historian to win the National Book Award. And I thought I should start with that. When Gordon Parks met Richard Wright in 1943, the author inscribed a copy of his best-selling novel, Native Son, to the young photographer. And he wrote, to one who moves with the new tide, which is a reference to the advancing progress toward equality for African Americans. In Parks, Richard Wright recognized a story of remarkable advancement propelled by talent, by dedication, and careful observation. And the term the new tide that Parks certainly recognized when Richard Wright wrote that in his copy of Native Son comes from Wright's book, 12 Million Black Voices, which you see on the screen. And the book finishes with this very short paragraph, which I'm going to read to you now, and you see it on the screen as well. We are with the new tide. We stand at the crossroads. We watch each new procession. The hot wires carry urgent appeals. Print compels us. Voices are speaking. Men are moving. And we shall be with them. And Gordon Parks certainly was with them. 12 Million Black Voices was a book that, that truly inspired Gordon Parks when he first saw it upon publication late in 1941. Born in Fort Scott, Kansas, Parks from a young age experienced poverty and acute racism, inequality on all sides. At the same time, he had a strong family, a large family around him that helped him to understand early in his life that he could probably do whatever he wanted, something he never forgot. So by the time Gordon Parks met Richard Wright, he had achieved his ambition of being a photographer. And Parks' rise to prominence was highly unusual at a time when African Americans rarely had control of their own images in the mainstream media. But in the years following World War II, some of the historical barriers for blacks in the media began to break down. And really, that's what this exhibition is about. Gordon Parks' The New Tide highlights the importance of Parks' work in shaping his innovative vision. So because much of the existing scholarship on Parks is based on his memoirs, books like A Choice of Weapons, To Smile in Autumn, etc., and interviews that he did, many, many interviews, I wanted to ground this project when I started on new research. In some ways, I understood that 
Most of the scholarship today about Gordon Parks is rooted in his own memoirs, in what he wrote about himself. And because I knew Parks and worked with him in the 1990s on another uh, big exhibition project, I also understood him as a storyteller, a great storyteller, who, in a sense, uh, embellished what he told the world about himself. He created a kind of mythology in order to encourage young people to follow in his own footsteps, to be able to understand that they also could do whatever they wanted with their lives to enter their, the profession of their choice. And so the story that he told us in some ways is parallel, sometimes counter, sometimes exactly spot on to the work that was done to create this exhibition, to, to what you're gonna see in the exhibition. And so really to do the research, which took me a long time to accomplish, I explored many primary sources of information. Historical archives, photographic archives, Gordon Park's papers, family history and genealogy, libraries, historic newspapers, as well as the extensive resources of the Gordon Parks Foundation, which also includes photographic prints, negatives, contact sheets, scrapbooks, family photographs, like you see up here. Uh, and so I gained many new insights that informed this project from these photographs, from letters, documents, manuscripts, and basic historical research. For example, how many of you knew that in 1922, Gordon Parks was in his school play in Fort Scott, Kansas. It was a play about hygiene. <laughs> he, he went to a segregated school. This is a play about hygiene, and he played the hairbrush. <laughs> that was reported in the Fort Scott newspaper, one of the newspapers that I, you know, I, I had to find to understand Park's background. And so, you know, there are many things that we learn that uh, I found uh, endearing in many ways. So we, we have a better picture of Gordon Parks now than we did uh, you know, before this project. So on, on your left up here, this is a, a photograph of Gordon Parks' mother, Sarah Parks. This is years before he was born. He was born in 1912. This is a photograph of a young Sarah Parks whose family had moved to Kansas from uh, Tennessee. They were descendant from slaves in Tennessee, as was the family of Gordon Park's father, who had also moved to Kansas from Tennessee. The photograph on the right is a portrait of a young Gordon Parks, looking very dapper. This is around 1938. And so by this time, he's actually a, a photographer, learning photography. And he's, it looks like he's about to go out and play golf, which he did do at the time. So there are elements of Park's early years as a photographer that were not known and are shown here in the exhibition and in the accompanying catalog for the first time. For example, his early portraits of friends and associates in and around the Southside Community Art Center. Those connect us to uh, the people, artists, writers, sociologists, and others who inspired Gordon Parks to do what he did. His transition from portraiture to fashion uh, photographs, uh, then to the social documentary form that defines his career is clarified by these early photographs. So that's what I set out to do in this exhibition, was to you know, come to an understanding of how Parks became a photographer and uh, how he uh, rose to the top of his profession in a period of 10 years from 1940 to 1950. In 1928, at the age of 15, Gordon Parks was sent north to St. Paul, Minnesota to live with a sister following the death of their mother. And his mother Sarah's final wish was for her youngest child, Gordon, to finish his education away from the south, away from the segregated environment of small town Kansas, so really with the Great Migration, Parks traveled north by train to live with his uh, older sister. And he struggled when he arrived in, uh, in St. Paul. He never finished high school. And during the 1930s, he worked a variety of jobs, 
including busboy, piano player, waiter, on the dining cars of the Northern Pacific Railway. Those were some of his jobs. In 1937, struck by photographs of Dust Bowl migrants seen in a magazine that he was given while working as a waiter for the Northern Pacific, Gordon Parks decided to become a photographer. And here you can see Parks' uh, application for employment at the Northern Pacific Railway. When he uh, applied, he was hired in June of 1936 for a salary of $65.60 a month. And you get a sense of his, his family, his wife, his height and weight, his schooling, a lot of information comes from things like employment applications. After buying his first camera in a pawn shop, Gordon Parks taught himself to use it, and soon he was making portraits for the Twin Cities African American newspapers and fashion pictures for a St. Paul uh, clothing shop. And you can see on the right an advertisement for Parks Studio in St. Paul. His studio at the time was in his kitchen, a newspaper article I found said that he was allowed to use it when his wife wasn't in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, that's very much of his time. His lights were made from light bulbs in tin cans, and his dark room was in the bathroom. So through his fashion work, Gordon Parks met socialite and model Marva Lewis, who was the wife of boxer Joe Lewis and she invited Parks to show his photographs in Chicago. These are two very early images from 1939. Portrait here, as reproduced in the St. Paul Recorder. My Such Eyes. Parks was hired as the staff photographer for the recorder. He did other assignments, like the one you see on the right here. He was the official photographer for the International Exposition in St. Paul in the year 1939. And he uh, also exhibited his photographs in this exhibition. He took this photograph, and in it, on the right, you can see some examples of Park's photographs, very fuzzy on the right, hanging one on top of another. So he was exhibiting his work as early as 1938, 1939. Other examples of photographs published here in the St. Paul Recorder were not quite as old as he, and on the right, an interesting article in the uh, St. Paul Pioneer Press in 1940, August 1940, and it reports on Parks having won an award at the American Negro Exposition in Chicago. He submitted his photographs to a juried exhibition there and won a significant award, which was reported in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, and they reproduced some examples of his work from the time. Interestingly, this is Gordon Park's clipping that he had saved in his papers of this article. And at the top, the, the actual headline says, Negro Porter's work praised. And Park cut that out. And he wrote there on the side, bartender. He didn't want to be referred to as a porter. So Gordon Parks meets Marva Lewis after she saw fashion pictures he did for a St. Paul clothing shop in the window. And then through this work, he was invited to Chicago. He showed his work, sponsored by Marva Lewis. He showed his work in Chicago. And then he moved with his family uh, to Chicago, not long after, in early 1942. Gordon Park's The New Tide, the exhibition, is structured in five sections to tell the story of Park's rise to prominence, a choice of weapons, government work, the home front, Standard Oil Company, New Jersey, and mass media. So now I'm gonna take you through the show, a quick tour. A Choice of Weapons refers to the title of Gordon Park's first memoir, which was actually written in 1966, looking back on how it is that he became a photographer. So this section of the show takes us through early images that he makes in uh, both Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Chicago. Two examples are here on the screen. On your left, Hilda Sims, who's a friend of Parks, University of Minnesota, a photograph from 1940. Hilda Sims then went on 
to move to New York and became a well-known actress there. And on the right is uh, Gordon Parks' portrait of Marva Trotter-Lewis, the wife of the boxer who inspired Parks. And I think this is a, a telling duo of photographs and that Parks is really experimenting here with how to make a portrait, how to light, uh, how to you know, convey a sense of mystery and uh, you know, something of the clothes. He's really learning to be a, a photographer uh, and in a sense a commercial photographer. Then while visiting Chicago's Southside Community Art Center in late 1940, Gordon Parks met the artist and exhibition director David Ross Jr. And David Ross encouraged Parks also, in addition to Marva Lewis, to move to Chicago. And the ambitious objective of the federally funded art center, the Southside Community Art Center, was to promote community participation to develop artistic talent, and to serve the cultural needs of the local neighborhoods. They taught art classes. Artists were employed to teach classes there. Exhibitions were held in the Southside Community Art Center. It was a, you know, a very important uh, point of exchange among artists in what was uh, then really one of the most important kind of percolating environments for African-American art in the country. Gordon Parks is in the middle of all of this. And in exchange for photography and teaching, providing the photography needs for the art center, David Ross and the art center director, Peter Pollack, offered him the full use of the center's darkroom, which was actually a, a, a closet in the basement, and free studio space upstairs the, on the very top floor of the art center. So Parks moved from St. Paul to Chicago Southside in April 1941. And here you can see a photograph of him in a painting class. This is the painter Eldier Courtour on the left. He's the teacher of the class. And Gordon Parks here in the center uh, participating in the class. I think he's actually, you know, he was there to pose with the class. It's a photograph taken by the great Farm Security Administration photographer Jack Delano in uh, April 1942. So when Parks moves to Chicago in April, he's accompanied by his wife Sally, their children, Gordon Jr. and Tony. Uh, and through the Art Center, he met many, many important artists, writers and scholars, many of whom became both his subjects and his friends. I wanted to just stop for a moment to show on the right, this is a a page from one of the many manuscripts for Park's first memoir, autobiography, A Choice of Weapons. This is for chapter 20, and it's just a little part where he describes moving to Chicago. And he writes, an accidental meeting one day in Chicago with David Roth. This is the last paragraph down here. The curator at the Southside Art Center led to my abrupt departure from the Twin Cities that fall. It turned out during our conversation in the galleries that his wife, Verlita, and mine had struck up a friendship, et cetera. And I wanted to mention this because you can see how Parks constructed his memoir by looking back at the manuscripts. It's actually cut up and taped together and heavily edited in many, many versions. And so uh, he's trying to craft a story, sometimes remembering very well what happened, sometimes not remembering. Uh, other times, you know, embellishing and adding, you know, kind of very fanciful parts that may and may not be true. And so uh, it was through the use of, you know, looking carefully at things like manuscripts and the edited manuscripts and speaking with uh, Jean Young, his one of Park's wives, who had edited this manuscript, you know, that I came to an understanding of, you know, the, the disparities between uh, what Parks wrote in his, in his memoirs and, uh, and what, you know, then I found in other papers and documents and manuscripts and photographs, et cetera. So it was a process of, in some way, decoding, you know, all of this uh, information that Parks left behind. And it's a process that, uh, you know, many artists set up for those of us who are art historians, you know, we have to go back and, and try to understand their life in the context of, of the politics and the society, social and 
cultural uh, context for, in which they lived and worked. So through the Art Center, Gordon Parks met many important artists, writers, and scholars. They became his subjects and friends, people like Margaret Burroughs, Horace Caton, Elger Cortor, who you saw in the previous photograph, Langston Hughes, portrait of Elaine Locke, here on the, uh, on the left with a, a bust exhibited in the Southside Community Art Center's inaugural exhibition by the great sculptor Richmond Barté. On the right, part, portrait of Charles White, who's sitting in front of his mural called Chaos of the American Negro from 1941. And in this photograph, you can see Charles White looking out, you know, really directly at the photographer, uh, holding his brushes, and he's pointing at Parks as though to say, you know, come and join us in the work that we're doing, political work, the social work, and the cultural work for the community of Chicago. Uh, at this time, Charles White, he's painting a mural which is, it depicts uh, the abolitionist John Brown leading a group of uh, slaves out of slavery. And so, you know, it's a complex community that Parks is engaged in here. And he's also photographing his friends who are encouraging him to then take his camera out of the studio and into the street. So it was painter Charles White who encouraged Parks to take his camera into the neighborhoods to document the poverty around them something many of the painters and sculptors working in and around the Art Center were doing. The Southside Community Art Center also hosted two of Park's earliest exhibitions, which helped him then to receive the prestigious Julius Rosenwald Fellowship to support the next phase of his career. As I said, he also photographed Langston Hughes in a beautiful series of experimental portraits. Here you see Hughes on the left with a sculpture by Marian Perkins, another artist working in the Southside Community Art Center. And then on the right, uh, his great portrait of Langston Hughes holding his hand inside of a picture frame as though to frame the hand of the writer rather than the face. And here they're, they're playing around and experimenting, you know, I think with new kinds of representation, how you would represent an artist. The painters working on the South Side, they called Gordon Park's photographs, you know, he was like a, a, a painter with a camera. They, they were very interested in how he was able to, you know, then take his camera out into the streets and make images that were very much like the social realist uh, works that they were, they were creating on, on canvas, in drawings, and in sculpture. So one of the very few surviving photographs that Parks took at this time is uh, this one here on your right. It's called Boy in Doorway. That was my title. It's really an untitled photograph that, that may be a, a picture that was shown at the Southside Community Art Center in their catalog that was called Cornered. And this image, you know, I, I'm very interested in this because, you know, it's one of the very first really social documentary pictures that Parks makes. And it's still, you know, an untrained photograph in many ways. It's a photograph that's very simple just a bit out of focus. And uh, it's also an extremely powerful picture that you know, kind of backs up this young boy into a corner in the middle of what looks like a very cold environment, you know, his coat half unbuttoned. And he's, uh, in a sense, you know, portrayed as though he has nowhere to go beyond where he is there, he has no opportunity. And then on the left, Park's uh, wonderful self-portrait this print is a print that Gordon Parks actually gave to his friend, maybe his best friend in Chicago, Charles White. And he inscribed it to my friend, a great painter, Charles White, Gordon Roger Parks, as he referred to himself. Okay, so as I said, Gordon Parks applied for and received a Julius Rosenwald Fund Fellowship in the first years, the first months of 1942 in order to support his training as a photographer. He was self-taught. Uh, he never went to school to learn how to make photographs. And his proposal here says, you know, his field is creative photography, and his plan of work is to spend one year portraying the Negro in his intellectual, professional, educational, social, farms, and urban life 
in such communities as New York and uh, Chicago, Nashville, et cetera. And so this, this is actually, you know, he, he's proposing also to work on uh, documentary and fashion and illustration and uh, pictorial photography. So he's really, he's requesting funds to, in a sense, train himself by going out and, you know, kind of attacking the world and, and looking at all these different places through all these different styles. And the Rosenwald Fund had never before uh, given a fellowship to a photographer. This was a fund that, in part, it was a, an amazing philanthropy that, in part, gave funding for African-American artists and scholars to further their careers. And they were uh, extremely savvy in understanding that Gordon Parks was a very, very talented photographer who needed very specific training to be able to realize the kind of vision in which he would become a real sp spokesperson for, you know, for the world in many ways. And uh, so the Rosenwald Fund had numerous ties between their organization in Chicago and the Farm Security Administration, a federal agency in Washington, D.C., today best known for its photography program. But the late 1930s, uh, this was an agency set up to help to resettle rural farmers and retrain them during the Dust Bowl era. And the photography unit was established to help to document that process uh, in order to get congressional funding to continue the work of the agency. Uh, many photographers we know today were involved in this, people like Walker Evans, uh, Dorothea Lang, Arthur Rothstein, Ben Sean, uh, John Vachon, John Collier, and Gordon Parks. So the Rosenwald Fund arranged for Gordon Parks to come to Washington in May of 1942. And you can see here this uh, wonderful letter that uh, I found in the archives of the Julius Rosenwald Fund at Fisk University in which the director of the, you know, the head of the Farm Security Administration, Will Alexander, a name I didn't know before, but you know, I've come to understand as being an incredibly important person in this whole process. He writes to William Haygood, who's the head of the uh, Rosenwald Funds Fellowship Program, and he says, I've talked with Roy Stryker. He has seen examples of Parksy's work and he would be quite willing to take Parks on as a sort of fellow of his department, helping him plan his work, giving him the benefit of his observations and participation in all that they are doing there, criticizing the work that he's done, et cetera. Roy Stryker then becomes an extremely important mentor for Gordon Parks. The next section of the exhibition is called Government Work. Farm Security Administration. So as I said, in April of 1942, a year after moving to Chicago, Gordon Parks was awarded a fellowship of $1,800 to assist in carrying you forward with your photographic work for a 12-month period. He moved to Washington, D.C. to work as a fellow in the Historic Division of the Farm Security Administration, established as a government New Deal program to document the lives and conditions of rural Americans during the Great Depression. His fellowship year proved to be transformational, granting Gordon Parks access to high quality equipment and a fast paced photo lab, as well as the mentoring of the director, Roy Stryker, and the expertise of other FSA photographers. So upon arrival in Washington during the early days of World War II, Gordon Parks discovered a largely segregated city. He had never lived in a segregated city like Washington. He'd come from Chicago. And Washington, during the early days of World War II, was legally segregated. Channeling his anger at the injustices he experienced, he often pursued stories that featured African Americans, photographing them at work, in tenement homes, or at their places of worship. As you see on the left, a photograph of three children waiting in the kitchen while their mother prepares the evening meal. 
made in June 1942, in a home in the alley. It's not more than half a mile from where we are right now, in southwest Washington, just the other side of the mall in the shadow of the Capitol. And then on the right, in newly built, federally funded government housing, segregated housing for African-American workers coming to Washington to help with the war effort is uh, a mother watching her children as she prepares the evening meal. Preparing dinner was a, you know, a, a significant subject for Farm Security Administration photographers. So in July of 1942, Gordon Parks begins to photograph Ella Watson, the woman who cleaned the offices of the Department of Agriculture, where the FSA had its own offices. And with the advice of Roy Stryker, Parks began using groups or sequences of photographs around a main theme to animate his stories. He made Watson, her work, family, neighborhood, and religious life the subject of his first extended picture story. And she soon became his most important subject. So in July of 1942, the American flag was on the cover of 300 magazines around the country, a coordinated effort by publishers everywhere. It was a symbol of patriotism. Uh, at the end of June 1942, Life had published the photograph you see on your left, USO Victory Bell, a beautiful white woman with a Liberty Bell hanging from her pendant there, uh, posed in front of the American flag. This was at the time, you know, the flag was everywhere in Washington. It was a propaganda image, and it was an image that represented patriotism. So Parks, when he met Ella Watson, he learned her, fam her, her story. Uh, as they talked, Parks learned more about Watson's complex life, her difficult life. She had struggled alone after her parents died. Her husband and two children were gone. She was a government employee for 26 years. She worked cleaning offices and sweeping stairways after hours until one in the morning without the possibility of advancement because she was black. Together with her adopted daughter, Loretta, she lived in a cramped second floor apartment on 11th Street Northwest and cared for Loretta's niece and two young nephews on Watson's annual salary of $1,080. For Parks, Watson's life of hardship embodied many of the ideas about race and discrimination that he had wanted to express in his photographs. So this photograph I'm showing you here, Washington, D.C. government charwoman, known years later as American Gothic, has become one of the iconic photographs in the history of photography, one of the most important photographs of the 20th century, and in some ways, I think its power comes from the sim simplicity of, of Park's deployment of, of symbolism. Uh, Ella Watson here is posed uh, upright at night while working, holding her broom. The mop is propped against a, a, uh, a table behind her. And she's posed in front of the American flag in the office of the notary public. The flag's a bit out of focus. And Watson's face is in perfect focus. She's looking a bit askance, but she's upright. A very professional woman, looking as though she has you know, accepted and yet still upset with her position of being unable to advance in her job because of her color. All this at a time when the government was, was using this, the symbolism of patriotism, certainly, but also a time when African Americans were being asked to fight in a segregated military and work in segregated defense industries. So it was the inequality of Ella Watson's position that Parks uh, has represented here, you know, in front of uh, this, this symbol for patriotism. And it's the irony of the, the combination of symbols uh, that makes this picture so powerful. In the exhibition, we've been able to borrow the original you know, the very first file prints that were made for the Foreign Security Administration of these photographs. And so uh, you can see the caption uh, written out on the left uh, and the pictures mounted on a gray board. 
These are the original prints and you know, very rare opportunity to see them in the exhibition. So as I said, it, the, the pictures years later uh, was titled American Gothic by Gordon Parks. Uh, you see the wonderful painting by Grant Wood, a realist painting, American painting from the mid 1930s now on hanging in the Art Institute of Chicago. It was a painting Parks would have known from his time searching the halls of the Art Institute of Chicago when he lived there and studying the paintings and works of art on view there. He learned so much from, from looking at other works of art in museums. At the same time, I think, you know, in some ways, you know, we've come to understand that you know, because of Parks titling this, that he actually modeled his photograph after Grant Wood's painting. You know, I, I question that in some ways because I, I know that he didn't title the, uh, the picture until years later. Also, it, was, it wasn't published until 1948. It wasn't published by the government or anyone else until 1948. This was a controversial portrait. I also think that Parks' understanding of uh, Jacob Lawrence's migration series uh, comes into play because of the simplicity of the, the symbolism that, that Jacob Lawrence uses. And in this uh, picture on the, on the right, which is from it's a panel number 59, the Laundress from the Migration series, you know, I think in some ways Parks is every bit as much interested in the depiction of the African-American woman worker and affording a, a sense of dignity to that worker as you see in Jacob Lawrence's uh, work. So Parks goes on, he photographs Ella Watson at work, he, photo he photographs her at home, her neighborhood. These are two images that really haven't been seen before. They were, they were put away uh, and never uh, published or uh, even made available by the Foreign Security Administration at the time. The next section of the exhibition is called The Home Front. As early as March of 1942, FSA photographers were farmed out on assignments for the Office of War Information, which was a new agency charged with consolidating all the federal information services related to the war effort. So the budget of the FSA was significantly reduced around this time by Congress, a result of political fighting over the resources as the U.S. involvement in, the, uh, in World War II deepened. So the historical section became, the, the historical section and the photography unit within it uh, became untenable then. And by the end of September of 1942, uh, Roy Stryker decided to move it into the growing organization of the Office of War Information. So Parks was among the photographers Stryker invited to join in the transfer to the Office of War Information, and subsequently many of Park's shooting assignments related to the OWI's domestic, journalistic, and propaganda needs. And as Park said, no physical change took place in the office itself. The pictorial emphasis was just shifted. It uh, shifted to industries and people and institutions involved in the war effort. He continued to photograph Southwest Washington, D.C., here you can see a woman reflected in the mirror of her home under a portrait of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, a strategy many FSA photographers used and Gordon Park learned there, using mirrors and windows and photographs within the frame, multiple frames, to give a sense of the complexity of a subject. It tells us uh, a bit of a story uh, when all of these things are put together. The, a uh, Harlem newsboy here posed in front of a, a poster for the Negro on the home front, which was a, a series written by Adam Clayton Powell, a uh, very important subject at the time in his magazine or his newspaper called The People's Voice. This is April 1943. And by this time, Parks has moved up to New York City and he's working in and around Harlem uh, you see on the right uh, another picture he made in Harlem of a, uh, a man, Marcus Garviait, reading the OWI publication, Negroes in the War. And on the left is a page spread from that important publication, 
which uh, came out in uh, December of 1942, and it featured many of Gordon Park's photographs. Uh, it was a publication uh, the government put out through the Office of War Information, intended to help to convince African Americans to support the war effort. And it was written by Owen Chandler, a public relations man. And it was, in a sense, asking for support at a time when the country was still segregated. Inequality was everywhere. And this was a, a propaganda mechanism uh, that was distributed to almost three million African Americans through churches and community centers and uh, newsstands all over the place, distributed free of charge. And then the photograph you see on the right shows that same woman who is uh, in her uh, home, her new home at the Anacostia Frederick Douglass dwellings. And she's, she was preparing dinner for her children and looking out the window at them playing. And here you see her in her bath, uh, bathroom, new, new uh, shiny bathroom. So these photographs were made for the Office of War Information purposes of helping convince African Americans to support the war effort. And in many ways, this was the reason why Parks came to Washington. Uh, it was to train him, but also to bring into the government a African American photographer capable of making these images. He also photographed on the streets of Harlem, as I said. This is a, a young boy in August of 1943, uh, just days after the Harlem insurrection. Major riot happens when a white policeman shoots a, a black soldier uh, in Harlem, and, and the community is in flames following that. On the right, Lieutenant George Knox, 332nd Fighter Group, training at Selfridge Field. Gordon Parks goes to Selfridge Field, Michigan, to photograph Tuskegee Airmen in training. And he wants to travel with them, going to, to Europe to photograph uh, black fighter pilots in combat, an image which would help to cement you know, the importance of African Americans in the war effort. And he was not allowed to go. It was a time when the government did not want uh, photographs made of African Americans in combat. In training was okay, but not in combat. So Parks was refused permission in the end, his deployment orders rescinded, and he leaves the Office of War Information at the end of 1943. At the same time, his photographs are being published in major magazines like U.S. Camera. And on the left is a magazine, another Office of War Information propaganda magazine called Victory, in which they published the photographs he made of, as they call it, Negro combat flyers ready for action, of pilots in training. So these were published by the government in early 1944. And then Parks, as I said, left the Office of War Information, and he travels to, to live full time in New York City. And he goes to work for Standard Oil Company, New Jersey, for a project that was directed there by his mentor and his, you know, the person who, who guided him and trained him at the Farm Security Administration, Roy Stryker. Stryker had already left the OWI and was enlisted by Standard Oil Company, New Jersey, to start a photography documentation program that was really a public relations program, in some ways not unlike uh, what he had done for the Foreign Security Administration. So here you see Gordon Parks with his, his camera in a box, his you know, lights in bags, his tripod, uh, and he's leaving on assignment here in April 1944, most likely traveling to Pittsburgh to photograph for the Standard Oil Company the grease plant in Pittsburgh. Parks, as I said, was hired by his mentor, Roy Stryker, as one of a small and talented team of photographers working for the public relations arm of Standard Oil Company, New Jersey, to help remake the public image of a troubled corporation. The company's difficulties dated to 1929, when they had made an agreement between Standard Oil Company, New Jersey, and the German chemical company, IG Farben Industry, and the agreement in a sense, uh, it was like a cartel agreement that prohibited Standard from developing synthetic rubber in exchange for Standard having guaranteed control 
of the petroleum market in the United States. And then by the 1940s, uh, IG Farben had uh, become complicit uh, with Nazi politics and crimes against humanity. And across the Atlantic uh, in the US, there was a shortage of rubber because Standard could not produce rubber or aviation fuel. And that threatened the American supply lines for the war. So they had a public relations problem. And uh, the photography unit was part of this uh, public relations program, uh, guided by new information and press strategies and following Stryker's lead. Uh, the small cadre of photographers worked to humanize the men of oil. And above all, I pictured the people who worked for the corporation and its international subsidiaries presenting the everyday face of petroleum production and its impact on communities. So Parks is making photographs like this. Cooper's plant at the Panola Incorporated grease plant, a subsidiary of Standard Oil. Parks photographed this man, an African-American worker who's cleaning the big drums that are used to produce grease. And he's, uh, he's cleaning it by dipping it in a, a vat of boiling lye. So Parks actually produces an image here, very carefully constructed posed photograph using lights arrayed behind the man, lights on his eyes, and a, a very low angle looking up at him to produce an image that's a really heroic image of an African-American worker working for Standard Oil, helping to produce the petroleum products necessary for America in the war effort. Parks travels around, he photographs the refineries, and in mid-January of 1944, he begins traveling throughout the Northeast and Canada. He photographs many things, farmers, families at, at dinner, uh, chemists, refinery operators, pipe fitters, customers in general stores, railroad workers, grease workers, artists, soldiers, sailors, fishermen, drilling crews, cowboys, woodchoppers, miners, sketchers, commuters, and travelers really the face of oil. And these two wonderful photographs are made in, in Canada, uh, in Black Diamond, Alberta, and also in the Northwest Territories in a small community called Yellowknife. So really to conclude, I want to talk briefly about Parks and mass media. Beginning in 1945, Parks begins uh, to do more assignment work for magazines, including Ebony, Circuit Smart Woman, Glamour, and Life. Uh, his work at Ebony, which was an illustrated monthly that was launched in 1945 and was dedicated to African-American social, political, and cultural issues, expanded the scope of his subjects, and it gave him more freedom to experiment with narrative and aesthetic ideas. And here you see a, an article that Ebony published about Gordon Parks in uh, July of 1946. So here he's becoming uh, much more well-known, prolific, and professional photographer, fully adapted and able to do all kinds of assignments from industrial work to social documentary work to magazine feature stories. And he begins to work and earn a very, very good living as a photographer based in, in New York City. The image on the left was made for uh, an issue of Ebony Magazine in 1947. On the right, uh, it's a, a picture of an alley in, in Harlem, 1948. And then through a very important project that Gordon Parks did with the writer Ralph Ellison that studied the impact of the environment of Harlem on the residents' uh, psychiatric health in Harlem, uh, the impact of the environment on psychiatric health. Through that project, Parks learned a lot about youth gangs because he was very interested and concerned about ways in which uh, young people had no opportunity to escape what was a, a very oppressive environment at the time. And so he pitched that the project he worked on with Ellison was never published, but he pitched a story about youth gangs in Harlem to Life magazine. And they hired him to do that story as a freelancer. And he then spent a number of months through the summer of 1948 photographing a young boy he met by the name of Leonard Red Jackson, who was then 17 years old, the leader of a youth gang called the Midtowners. And so he followed Red Jackson and 
the, his friends and his rival gangs. And, you know, after getting to know him and gaining trust, he made what was, I think, a very, very important and significant contribution to Life magazine in an article called Harlem Gang Leader. It's the title of the article. So Parks finally broke away from Standard Oil Company, New Jersey, through the work he was doing for mass media and his ongoing assignment work when Life agreed to publish Harlem Gang Leader. And then because of the success of that story in Life, Life's executive editor hired Gordon Parks in February of 1949 as the first African-American photographer on staff at the world's leading picture magazine. So Gordon Parks, by this time, had then become the first uh, photographer working in a mainstream magazine on their staff at that level. Uh, He became the one who really unlocked that door for the future. And I think because of that, you know, Gordon Parks then became a a kind of symbol for one's ability to rise very rapidly using using all of his his talents uh, to the to the top of his profession he went on to photograph the first assignment as a staff photographer was to photograph the Paris fashion shows so he begins to travel internationally he was a very accomplished fashion photographer already but Park's first assignment for life was to photograph the fashion shows, as you see here on the left. Another you know, wonderful assignment was to photograph French models as they uh, gained success in the United States. And then this uh, photograph on the right shows you know, his approach, which was really unusual, to a story about a, two fashion models. Here he's photographing you know, the great Vogue photographer, Erwin Blumenfeld, photographing the model who was the subject of of Park's assignment. And here you see, you know, just, just what it means to be a photographer. You're looking through a, a, you know, a large format view camera at an image that's backwards and upside down, uh, as Parks had learned. And then in 1950, he also was asked to develop a, a photographic essay on school segregation. And to do that, he chose to go back to Fort Scott, his hometown, to photograph the segregated school that he had gone to himself, the middle school called the Plaza School. He returned to Fort Scott in May 1950, photographed the landscape of his childhood, along with the old Frisco railway station he'd passed through uh, when he left Fort Scott in 1928. And he photographed his childhood friends to find out what had happened to them. You know, the successes or, or not, you know, successes and, and failures of his friends who had come out of a... Of a um, a segregated school. He was himself a, a great success by 1950, although Parks never, the Life magazine never published uh, the story called Back to Fort Scott. And it's the one that really concludes this exhibition. So just a couple of things to remember uh, when you look at the exhibition, and I encourage you all to see it if you haven't. Um, Gordon Parks went on to produce um, significant work for life uh, after 1950. He also began to compose music again. He wrote novels and memoirs. uh, And he was the first African-American artist to direct a major motion picture in Hollywood. We're going to host a film series of Parks' films. um, But if you don't know, um, you know, Parks uh, broke also the barrier of of, uh, blacks making films in Hollywood. Uh, 1969 with his, uh, his first feature film uh, called The Learning Tree based on his own uh, autobiographical novel. And then he went on to direct Shaft and other uh, great uh, examples of African-American films in the 1970s. And then today, I think Park's photographs, uh, as well as his stories, the stories he tells us, uh, which are part fiction, part fact, uh, they kind of hover between the two. Um, and that's always in his photographs. Uh, so these stories are instrumental in understanding how the world views African American history and culture today and how African Americans see themselves today. Thank you. <laughs>